today I want to talk about how I made this miniature weld effect in Blender. This isn't exactly a tutorial, more of a making of, but if you've got a basic understanding of the Blender interface, you should have no problem following along with what I did. The original idea for this piece was to make a water wheel, which would be kind of suspended in nothing, almost like a snow globe. While I was researching, I came across this little diorama of an English cottage, and I instantly knew that it had exactly the vibe that I was going for in my head. I wasn't sure exactly how big I wanted the scale of this whole scene to be, so I figured a better idea was to build out the house first, and then we could make the rest of the scene around it, and we would know exactly what scale to use. I imported this image of a door which I got from 3D Textures and I start to use loop cuts and extrusions to build out the basic shape. Cutting up photos like this is a method I use quite a lot these days to get really quick results. It doesn't work so well always if it's going to be close to the camera but if it's further in the distance you don't need to worry about it and you get some really nice results. A few of the areas did need a little bit of clean up because the door handle obviously overlaps parts of the glass and the door. The simplest fix for this was to just select those faces and reproject them onto different parts of the image where there is no overlap. For instance, I got parts of the glass that were clean and I just reprojected over there. I also wanted to give a little bit of extrusion to all those metal bolts that are in the door instead of just having them flat. But cutting out each one of those by hand using the knife tool would take a really long time and it probably wouldn't look very neat. So instead, I just used a bunch of circles and the knife project tool to cut them out. Knife project is a really handy modelling technique which I don't see when used too often in Blender. It allows you to create knife cuts based on the edge geometry of another mesh. You just add a mesh, in, for instance this plane, and then you add a cutter object, in this case a circle. You select the cutter and then you shift select the plane to make it the active object. If you hit tab to go into edit mode with both objects, you can then select the knife project from the mesh menu. The knife project tool works based on the camera's perspective and it's really handy when it comes to cutting out more complex shapes that you couldn't normally do unless you use something like a boolean. I knew that this scene was going to take place during a summer rain shower so I needed to replicate a little bit of water on most of the surfaces. My go to trick for this was to add a musgrave texture with the detail cranked all the way up and the dimension value cranked all the way down. Then I just used this node to control the clear coat or the roughness value of most materials. It makes it look like there's a little bit of surface splashes of water on top of every material and you can change the scale to get different effects. In my opinion CGI bricks tend to look really bad if they're just made from a simple texture set slapped onto a flat surface. You need to have some sort of displacement in there too in order to get a realistic effect, especially if you're using like crooked old bricks like I'm using for this cottage. The best way to get a more realistic effect is to use displacement. This texture set came with a height map which pushes and pulls vertices out of the mesh creating real depth that can't be replicated with just a normal map. Blender has something called micro displacements too which are handled at the render level inside the shader. You can activate it simply by changing this material setting to displace. Then if you hook up a height map to the material output via a displace node you will get some displacement. Since displacements work by pushing and pulling out the geometry you obviously need to have a very dense mesh with lots of subdivisions in order to get any sort of fine details. This is actually a real problem because very heavily subdivided meshes are going to make Blender very slow, it's going to make your render times longer, and to be frank it's probably going to cause a lot of crashes. To get around this limitation we can change Blender's feature set to experimental mode. Now if you go to the subdivision surface modifier you'll see this new option called adaptive subdivision. Adaptive subdiv changes how subdivided a mesh is based on how close that part of the mesh is to the camera. It can give you this really nice finely detailed displacement and it won't bog down Blender as much since the parts of the mesh that are further away from the camera simply won't be subdivided as much. And it's dynamic too so if the camera moves closer to something that should have more displacement on it, it's going to subdivide the mesh up more so you can always get this really nice result no matter where the camera is in the scene. A while back I made a procedural terracotta material for my Patreon supporters. I remember that I made some nice pots for that so I decided to add those to this scene. While I was doing that I realised that the moss component of this material would work really well with a lot of the other materials in this scene. It would make them look a little bit more aged and like they're sort of grown into the world. So I created a new node group that just had the moss component. 
you can just drag that into any material in the scene, connect it up to the very end of the node tree and it would automatically cover whatever material it was in this nice layer of wet moss. I'll be adding an updated version of this material to my Patreon sometime later this week. The walkway outside the house was literally just made by stretching out a cube, duplicating it a bunch of times and moving it into the basic shape of the structure. Every time I duplicated one of the cubes, I also moved the UV map to a different spot on the image texture just so you'd get a little bit of less obvious repetition. I used the hue saturation node just to drop the value of the texture a little bit since it's supposed to be wet wood. In fact, I did this pretty much any time I dealt with an absorbent material in the scene, like the stones or the rocks. Most absorbent materials become a little bit darker at least when they get wet. I also went around all the planks and I added just some random variation. Just because something's man-made doesn't mean it has to be all straight lines and 90 degree angles. In real life, you get a lot of these nice little subtle twists and bends, rotations, slightly misaligned pieces that can really add to the realism without adding much extra work. For the plants in this scene, I use this amazing tool called Botanique. If you watched my video from last week, you'll already know about this add-on. It's got this really great library of ivy and growing vines that work really well to cover up the cottage. I really like the fact that the vines have certain shapes so they can fit around door frames and windows and even corners. To make the scene feel a little bit more lived in, I also just used the quick smoke effect on the chimney stacks to add a little wisp of smoke coming out the top. Since this scene was going to take place through a little bit of a summer shower, I wanted to add a wind force to the side as well so it would just be blowing the smoke across the screen instead of having it going straight up. So with all the main objects in place, it was time to create the world. I added a sphere and in wireframe mode, I selected the top half and deleted it. Then I just capped off the top to make a half sphere. As it stands, the geometry of this half sphere at the moment isn't ideal for sculpting, so I used the remesher tool just to give me some nicer quad geometry, and then I went in with the smooth tool and I smoothed all the way around in the sculpting panel. And then for the top pond, I used the clay strip brush just to basically carve out the shape. I really like using the clay strip brush when it comes to this because it gives you kind of geological features for free. Like you can just naturally scrape away out of part of the ground, it's like, oh, that looks like rock which is pretty cool. Finally, I just separate the top part of the garden from the bottom part of the sphere, and I separate those into their own objects, then I did a quick UV unwrap on both of them, and I just added this like muddy soil texture. For all of the grass in the scene, I went back to Botanique. It has this really good tool for scattering different particle systems like grass. You just select the asset that you want and click scatter, and it scatters a particle system all over the thing with a few little settings that you can tweak. But then you can press the weight paint tool and you can just quickly paint on exactly where you want each grass particle to go. So I used four or five different grass particles for this. For instance, there was a main grass which covered pretty much everything. And then there was this sort of longer wild grass which I put around the surface of the pond, around the edges. And I used this uh, floral grass that had these little yellow flowers in it to go at the other side, at the front of the house that you can't see. Botanique has a really good library of flowers, shrubs and trees as well, which I used to bulk out the rest of the garden scene really quickly. A lot of the trees in Botanic are animatable as well. You just select the tree you want to animate and then select which type of wind animation you want to apply from a drop down and it'll automatically apply that to the tree. The developer of Botanic was good enough to give me a discount code to pass on to you guys. You can get 33% off any version of Botanic until the 21st of August. If you're interested in doing scenes that have a lot of plants in them, I suggest you snap it up while that's on because it is a really good offer. You'll find the discount code and my affiliate link for Botanic in the description of this video. If you want to know how to place assets manually like grass without using something like Botanic Scatter System, I suggest you check out the video that I posted last week where I tried to recreate a Bob Ross painting in the time it took him to paint it on the TV show. So at this point I decided to add a few little animated ducks to the scene. Ian Hubert's already made a better video on this topic than I ever could, so I'm just going to point you in the direction of his video, but it's basically just a case of adding a subdivision surface modifier to a cube and kind of extruding it until it kind of looks like a duck, and then just applying that texture onto the shape, add a quick armature so you can move the duck's head around, and then you just add a little animation. There's really not a lot to it. I think the rain and the pond were actually far more interesting than the ducks. 
I made a circle above the scene which I filled in just by pressing F and then I used a simple icosphere as a raindrop as part of a particle system that was attached to that circle. I set the velocity of the particles to a negative value so that all the particles would drop straight down and I used a really high number, I think 80,000 particles. Then I added a plane that would be the water in the pond and I gave that a load of subdivisions. Making the rain effect on water is actually quite easy using the dynamic paint tool. Dynamic paint is basically a way that you can tell one mesh to affect another mesh in Blender. You just select the water plane and you make it a dynamic paint canvas. Then you select the particle emitter and you make that the brush. Then under the drop down settings for the emitter, you want to just make sure that the actual particle system is the brush and not the mesh that it's been emitted from. There's loads of different settings involved with dynamic paint and I'm not going to bore you by going through all of them in this video. It's basically just a case of trial and error. You just play around with different settings, say what looks good and then bake out the animation when you've got something that you like. So after loads of trial and error I did end up with a simulation that kind of looks like the pond's been hit by loads of different drops of water. So no little countryside garden would be complete without a flag. I added this image of a Union Jack into the scene and I just cut it up with a few lub cuts. It doesn't really need much. I selected two verts near the pole and I created a new vertex group with those verts inside it. Then in the cloth settings I could just go down to the pin group section and I could use the vertex group as the pin. What that essentially does is it excludes those verts from the cloth simulation so that the flag will stay attached to the pole. I added a force field for the wind and I just used that to blow the flag around a little bit. It took a ridiculously high level of wind for some reason to get this thing to blow around but eventually I got it to work. I did also think that the scene looked a little bit strange without some sort of fence or wall going around the outer perimeter. So I quickly just created this fence that was missing the right hand post. What that means is that it was basically tileable. I could add an array modifier and I could just repeat the fence as many times as I wanted. I set the array type to a mode called fit to curve, then I selected a circle curve object that I made to go around the size of the garden. The fit to curve mode basically does exactly what it sounds like, it makes the array go on for the length of a curve. In order to make the array match the shape of the curve too, we have to add a curve modifier afterwards and just select the curve that we've made to drive that as well. If you do everything right, you'll have this repeating object that adheres to the length and the shape of a curve. Then you can just subdivide the curve and you can move it around and shape it however you like. One word of warning though, it is really important that the array object and the curve object have the exact same origin point or this isn't going to work. To create the roots that are coming out of the soil underneath, I actually used just a few more curves. If you add a curve and then go into edit mode and delete all the verts, you can press T and see that there's this little draw mode icon. Then if you press the end panel and under active tool you can change the depth mode to surface. What that will allow you to do basically is just draw a curve straight onto any surface. Then you can go into the geometry settings for the curve and just give it a little bit of depth to make the roots a little bit thicker. This method worked pretty well for the roots and it also works really well if you want to do like a pile of pipes or cables on the floor or some cable that's going like sort of up the side of a building. It works really well for that. I use this all the time. Okay, so I was in the final stretch now and things were starting to look good with most of the scene together, but I did think it looked a little bit strange that the world was kind of this hemisphere when I imagined it always as being more like a total sphere. So to finish off the other end of the sphere, I thought it'd be a good idea to add some clouds. I just basically made a half sphere that covered the area where the clouds should be. And then in the shader editor, I added a principal volume shader and I connected that up to the volume. I just controlled the density of that shader using a noise modifier and a color ramp. In the end, I actually ended up replacing the principal shader with an emission shader set to a really low value, which is a nice way to get volumetrics that aren't very noisy, because unfortunately the clouds as it was set up were very, very noisy and it did look pretty poor even with denoising turned on. Sometimes it's worth sacrificing a little bit of quality if you can just massively bring down your render times. So at this point I realised that the rain particles which I created earlier just weren't going to make the final cut. With motion blur turned off they looked like they were moving really slowly and with motion blur turned on everything just became a streaky mess. I'd need a different solution. 
So a few years ago, just to test out the capabilities of AV, I made this really simple Jurassic Park scene at night with the rain. And to make the rain for this, I just used stock footage of some rain and I composited it in After by setting it to screen mode in After Effects. So I did the same thing here to make the rain. Uh, just to make it look like the rain was interacting a little bit more with the world though, I also added some video textures of water splashes. These particular splashes were filmed by Ian Hubert, but you can also make them yourself really easily just using a liquid simulation in Blender. CG Geek has a really great video all about making rain, including this part of the technique. I'll link to that in the description. So with all the hard work done, it was time to render this out and get to compositing. I made two main render passes for this. There was one that had the house and the world on it, and there was another one that had the cloud and the smoke. Once I put those together, I made another render pass, which was just the Z depth. Luckily, Z depth passes don't need many samples, so they're very fast. I think I used like five samples denoised. And the Z depth pass just allows me to add a little bit of fog into the scene, especially near the start, and the fog gradually disappears as the camera moves out. Finally, I thought it would be nice to tie everything together with a little bit of atmosphere that just went around the whole world as the camera moved out. To make this pass, all I did is I made the world, space, the whole environment black, created a sphere that was a little bit larger than everything else in the scene, and I made that a white emission shader, and then I just brought that render pass into After Effects and I used that as a matte after I blurred it a little bit. It gave you this nice little hazy atmosphere around the whole world. So with a little bit of colour grading you get the final scene which looks like this. I was actually really pleased with how this came out, it was an enjoyable process to make and I'm actually very tempted to make more of these miniature worlds with different ideas, different sorts of environments. If that's something you want to see let me know in the comments. I'd also appreciate it if you hit the like and the subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll catch you later with another video.